That's so like how much how much damage can we get due to our characters? Right. Like, Bruce Willis in Die Hard. That guy should have been dead. He is just so tough. Realistically, you take a wound in your arm, you don't fight again for six months. You take a wound in the side, you don't fight again for six months. You take a wound in the leg, and you can't march. You are not on the battlefield. You're down. That's it. Um, you know, I mean. The Stormlight Archive book series is chock full of interesting characters. Indeed, almost everyone I talk to who has read the series has a different favorite character. So you can imagine the struggle I had in making this video. There are countless characters who are important to this universe, and unfortunately I can't talk about all of them, yet. So I went ahead and picked 10 characters who are shaping up to be instrumental in Rhythm of War and arranged them in no particular order. Let's go ahead and begin with... Kaladin Stormblessed is one sad, masochistic, beautiful, precious, masochistic, masochistic boy. He starts off as a surgeon turned hardened soldier who witnessed his brother's death on a battlefield somewhere on the border of Yaakoved, and it really only got worse from there. After suffering through his entire squad slaughter at the hands of Amaram, Kaladin is made a slave, running bridges on the Shattered Plains in Sadius' army. But Kaladin, while near suicidal since his chance of survival is so small, pushes past the doom, if not the gloom, and forms a bond with an honor spren named Silfrena. We see him grow throughout the books from a lowly, self-described wretch into a leader of men. He transmutes his fellow slave brigade from a simple bridge crew into first a squad of coordinated fighters, then the personal bodyguards of Dalinar Kalin, and finally into a budding order of Knights Radiant. But Kaladin has not done this all for Dalinar or even the Order alone. Kaladin is the type of person who wants to protect everyone. He has to protect everyone. A fair bit of his character arc in the fourth book is likely going to revolve around Kaladin's inability to accept that he will never, under any circumstances, be able to save everyone. That the losses he has witnessed are not his fault, and that the good he does is not required to be without failure. We see Kaladin refuse to accept beliefs like these and blame himself for any death he witnesses. Many fans speculate that his fourth oath has something to do with accepting he will never be able to protect everyone, which would make sense considering his character's trajectory so far. Kaladin, we just want you to feel better, and we hope that you find some sort of peace by the end of the fifth book. Almighty knows you deserve it. Renar and Kalin is a bit of an oddball throughout the series. He has always been different from other people, but in nothing is this more telling than his spren. You see, Renarin is a member of the Order of Truth Watchers. However, his spren is not like other Truth Watchers spren, as it has been corrupted or enlightened, depending on whom you ask, by the unmade Ja'anat. This corruption grants him access to the surge of progression which is normally attainable by Truth Watchers, but transforms the Truth Watchers' surge of light weaving into something else. It would seem that this surge has transformed into something more akin to that of Future Sight, a power only known to be accessible to Voidbinders. It is unknown just how this is possible, but there are hints that Ja'anat actually desires to join the side of the Radiance, which brings up these questions. Will this lead to new forms of Knight's Radiance? How benevolent is Sha'anat exactly, and how much autonomy does she have over her own actions? Will she be able to escape the influence of Odium, or will something drastic have to be done to bring her over to the side of the Radiance? All of these questions will be very important in Rhythm of War, and almost all the answers revolve around Renarin in one way or another. His story is one of the more interesting in the Stormlight books, and we can't wait to see where his story goes next. It's bound to be enlightening. Shalandavar is quickly losing her identity. While she was once simply herself, 
Traumatic circumstances and feelings of inadequacy have led her to use light weaving and imagination to create multiple alternate personalities for herself. She uses her veil personality primarily for espionage and her radiant personality for more diplomatic situations. These multiple personas prove quite confusing to her new husband, Adeline, but the two have struck a balance of sorts that both parties are comfortable with. As an educated guess, it could be that Shallon spends this book reconciling the differences within her personalities and remakes herself into a more mentally healthy and stable person. It's going to be a rough road to get there though. Shallon has a few secrets that have not yet been revealed, and whatever she's keeping back is bound to be an absolute bombshell to her sanity and mental stability. Whether her secrets build up to a breaking point, cement in place the status quo, or reshape her once more, we will have to see. But no matter what happens, it's probably gonna get weird. Relaine is unique among Bridge 4's crew. He is the only Parshendi to have joined so far, having been with Kaladin's company when Bridge 4 was nothing more than a simple bridge crew. We've seen him transform from a listener spy into a valuable asset for Kaladin's budding squad of Windrunners. And yet, he is not a Radiant himself. He has shown great initiative in protecting others of his own volition and appears to be traveling down a path towards bonding a wind's friend. But there's only one problem. There have never been any Parshendi Radiants before. Not ever. I believe that Relaine will find a way to bond a Spren and join Kaladin in the skies by the end of Rhythm of War. It's not going to be an easy path though. We'll get into a bit more detail on the mechanics later in the video. In the meantime, let's just say that Relaine will more likely than not make a fantastic Windrunner, and I can't wait to see him in action. Some time after the death of Gavilar Kalin, King Teravangian found himself with a problem. He knew Roshar was in dire trouble, and he knew he simply could not save it by himself. He wisely assumed that the Alephi would be of no help without the eldest Kalin brother, now long dead. And so, he journeyed to the valley where the Night Watcher resides and asked Cultivation herself for the capacity to save humankind. She granted him a form of brilliance, and in a single day he developed an insanely complicated and comprehensive guide to saving Roshar, referred to as the Diagram. This would be the key to the world's salvation. That day proved the height of his brilliance, however, with varying degrees of intelligence from that day on. His days of enlightenment seem randomly given, interspersed with days of reduced intelligence, but a greatly enhanced sense of empathy. A secret society formed around his work, using the diagram as both a guide and their title. As a direct result of following the path to the future etched out in the diagram, King Teravangian has predicted quite a few events and come into the possession of the entirety of Jacobin. But the more one attempts to sway the present to conform to an ideal future, the more troubles will inevitably arise. Teravangian's plans were more or less steamrolled by Dalinar, refusing to be killed by Seth, and then subsequently not giving in to Odium. How rude of him. This forces Teravangian, and by extension the Society of the Diagram, to make a secret deal with Odium and work alongside him. In return, Odium spares Carbrant and its people, not Roshar, just Carbrant. This is where we leave Teravangian at the end of Oathbringer, and it's not like he's exactly in the best position. He just made a secret deal with Odium, Dalinar does not trust him anymore, and the diagram has gone pretty far off course from where it was at the beginning of the Way of Kings. His story is bound to take some interesting turns in the future, so be sure to keep an eye on him in Rhythm of War. I sure as hell will. I mean, he's Uncle T. <laughs> Adeline Kalin, slayer of light-eyed female hearts, has finally settled down and decided on a single woman. The only problem he has is that this one woman is currently functioning more like three women. While he is absolutely in love with his wife Shallon, he also feels concerned that her personalities might not be so faithful to their marriage, especially Vale. This is combined and compounded by his lack of a spren bond, and he is very quickly being rendered more or less obsolete. But Adeline is just the best guy, and never really complains about this or outwardly expresses any feelings of ill will towards his new radiant acquaintances. In fact, he appears to be forming some sort of a unique bond with his sword. Many fans have speculated that he is going down some sort of path towards restoring the life of Myaloran, the spren currently trapped in the form of his shard blade. Since winning his blade, 
Adeline has taken good care to treat the blade well and has somehow formed a deeper connection with Maya, though it is not certain how. After spending some time around her in Shadesmar during the course of Oathbringer, Adeline is able to summon Maya in just seven heartbeats, whereas normally it would take ten. This has some pretty big implications for dead Spren, and might lead to a discovery in the way of reviving them, which in turn would leave living Spren less reluctant to form the hell bonds, leading to more radiance, leading to Adeline completely solving the problem of desolations and also human suffering. Okay, maybe not that last one. But he most certainly does have an interesting future ahead of him. Seth's son, son Volano, Truthless of Shinovar, is no longer following orders from a rock. Which is good, because he is far more useful now that he is following the orders of Dalinar Kalin. We have yet to see where Seth fits into this new generation of Radiance, the storms we haven't even seen as Spren yet. It's rarely deigned to appear to even Seth. I have a sneaking suspicion that this has something to do with either Nightblood or how Nail somehow reattached Seth's soul back onto his body, but there's no real indicator either way. We also have yet to see how Dalinar Kalin will react to Seth joining up with him. Keep in mind, after all, it was only six years ago that Seth slightly assassinated Dalinar's brother, and it's been significantly less time since Teravangian had Seth going around on a murdering spree of political leaders. I'm not sure the Kalins are going to be exactly happy to have Seth around. This is just wild speculation here, but I could totally see Dalinar letting Seth just kind of off the leash to enact the fourth ideal he's for. The Skybreaker's fourth ideal is unique, you see, and its name the ideal of Crusade, might give you a hint why. The crusade Seth and his spren have chosen is to cleanse the Shin of their false leaders so long as Dalinar Kalin agrees. We're not sure what exactly this might entail, but it will most likely lead to Seth confronting his past as well as those that declared him truthless in the first place. Whether this happens in Rhythm of War or the next book, we'll have to wait to find out, but rest assured, Seth's story is going into weird, possibly crazy revenge-filled territory, and it will be quite interesting to see how it all plays out. Let's talk about our friend Dalinar. I've already made one video talking specifically about where Dalinar is headed, and plan to make one more before Rhythm of War comes out. So I'm going to take this time to focus on an aspect of Dalinar Kalin that often goes overlooked. Dat boo. <laughs> Lyft herself calls him a tight butt at one point, and Dalinar does not seek to deny this. Indeed, all evidence suggests that he is indeed physically fit. Could it be possible that this man we've grown to know so much about has been hiding a fantastic butt from the readers this whole time? The plot lines are stupid and hard to predict, but I think we can safely assume wherever Dalinar goes in this book, he will be followed by a rock-solid caboose. Navani Kalin has been married to Dalinar Kalin for over a year at this point, and it is all but confirmed that she appreciates Dalinar's derriere. On a completely unrelated note, I've previously talked about Navani's character arc and where she's heading, but there are some interesting things I didn't talk about in my last video about her. In both Words of Radiance and to a greater extent Oathbringer, she begins to design and fabricate machines of war utilizing Fabriel technology in unique and interesting ways. For instance, she designed and built mobile raised platforms for archers, Fabrials that take away pain, and even plans for big Fabriel powered airships. I have a sneaking suspicion that we'll see the last one show up in Rhythm of War, as over a year has passed in between books and promotional material speaks of an arms race between the two sides. If Nimbani really does start launching airships, how will the fuse respond? And for that matter, has Nimbani tried trapping voids, Bren, at all? I would bet they produce a different result and might even have to run off a void light. Since this book in particular is said to place more emphasis on Navani, we are quite likely to see the veil of secrecy lifted off of Fabrials and how they work. Fabrials could have huge implications, and if she is integral to shaping Fabrial technology as well as awakening Urethiru, I have a whole video talking about this, she will likely go down as one of the all-time most influential people in Rosharan history. You could say, in a sense, that Rhythm of War is Ven Lee's book. Its flashback chapters focus on her and her late sister Ashonai as they rediscover humanity as well as the listener's lost gods. 
Benly is on the fast track to becoming a will shaper after speaking the first oath and bonding with the Light Spren Tamber. This somehow traps the Void Spren residing within Fenley's gem heart in a way Odium cannot detect. It is unclear if this gives her different powers from a normal Radiant, and she has yet to access her Surge Binding on screen. While her story leaves off a bit open-ended at the end of Oathbringer, there is the implication that Fenley is going to seek out her former people, the listeners. Both her and Blaine are wondering what happened to the listeners after the Battle of Narak. Remember, they were both members. We're not sure how many survived, much less how many still have their minds intact and free of Odium's control. I have a strong suspicion that Venli's story will focus on finding and reuniting her people, forging a Parshendi coalition to fight and live alongside humans. Her arc seems to be ultimately about atoning for and learning from the mistakes she made in the past, which will likely be highlighted in the flashback chapters she shares with her sister. It will be fascinating watching her form a bond that has never before existed. This may even serve as a template for how future Parshendi could form in a hell bond. Before I take my leave, I'm going to leave you with one last interesting note. Brandon actually never originally planned to have Fen Lee flashback chapters. These flashbacks would have been from the perspective of her late sister Ashonai. While this would have been an interesting literary device, I'm glad he chose to write the flashbacks from both perspectives. Indeed, from what I hear, Fenley's chapters were supposed to give some really juicy big picture Cosmere information. I cannot wait to talk all about it with you when the book comes out. Okay, that about wraps up this episode of Cosmere Connections. Make sure to subscribe for all the fun videos I have planned if I don't run out of time before November. We got a video on the Radiance, we got another video on Dalinar, and if I have time I might even throw in a video ruminating on Kaladin, our resident sad boy. I don't know, who knows. And if I do run out of time, well, we have another, what, around three years till the next Stormlight? I'm sure this book will give us more than enough to talk about in the meantime, and it has even been mentioned The Lost Metal, the final book in Mistborn Era 2. Ugh, so much good stuff. Storms, I've had fun making this video, and hopefully you've had even half that fun watching it. I'd kindly remind you to like, subscribe, and follow me on Twitter for some quality creme posting as well as, you know, general updates. Have a great day, folks. Boom.